Hey guys, we are going to continue our Supernatural series. So, so far we have had Supernatural Prayer, where we learn about how God wants to use prayer to release His supernatural power, which Peter talked about, which we loved, that we need to, what was it, uh, step out in faith and like overcome fear. I had it just the other day, I did it this morning. And, uh, and then we had Grace last week talk about Supernatural Faith, and she concluded that with a rap to Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, all about faith, which was pretty awesome. This morning, though, we're going to look at the next part of our Supernatural series, and I want to start by just telling a story. And uh, so for me, uh, I had my first experience with God's supernatural power and uh, Him healing someone uh, through prayers that I prayed when I was about 22, and I was at a conference down in Melbourne. Now, I got to this conference because an elderly gentleman in my church in Ballarat, he was 70, yeah, that's right, like genuinely he was old, Uh, he invited me to come to this conference and hang out with him for the weekend. And obviously every 22-year-old knows the best party you can ever go to is a party with a 70-year-old down in Melbourne at a Christian conference. Like, that was wild. So I went down there with him, we did Sudokus, we did crosswords, we did a few word searches, some trivia that was found in the paper, and we were in bed by 9.30 every night. Now I tell you what, I've never felt so refreshed as having eight and a half hours sleep. Uh, It was uh, phenomenal, it was uh, really, really good. Uh, But also... While we were there, we got the opportunity to hear some really great speakers, but then we also saw them do something very similar to what we've been doing, where we've been having the message, and then we've been having uh, people uh, come up and go, hey, we felt like God has been saying this, we feel like God wants to heal this, or we feel like God uh, wants to speak this to someone, or you know, do that sort of stuff. Like, so they were doing that, and so at one of the sessions, this happened. They did the message, then the guy got up and was like, hey, we want to see God heal this, we want to see God do that, and so uh, we... Uh, with hearing that, and my friend who I went down with, his name was John, he stood up, and I was like, oh, cool, I can pray for John, he's my friend, that's easy. Uh, but I asked him, I said, John, what is it that you would like prayer for? And he's like, oh, look, I would like prayer for my hearing. As you can see, I've got hearing aids in, I can't hear very well, I'd love to get my hearing back. And I thought, hmm, well, you are old, so I don't know quite how that works. Because you just, I think you generally lose lose your hearing because you're just old. And he probably went to too many heavy metal concerts when he was younger. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't. He definitely didn't. He likes classic. But anyway, uh, I was like, all right, John, I can pray for you. And I was preparing to pray for him. And I was pretty confident because I've seen Jesus give people their hearing back in the Bible. And I've seen that happen before. So I was like, you know what? This will be fine. John can get his hearing back. I imagine that this is possible for Jesus. And then as I'm about to start praying, this woman just taps me on the shoulder just taps me on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a bit weird. And so I turn around and I'm like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm just going to pray for John over here. And she's like, oh, I just would like you to pray for my husband because I just think it'll be better if you pray for him than I pray for him. Now, I was super confused because I'm like, surely, I wasn't married at the time, like, but surely you would want to pray for your husband, like he's your husband. So I just thought, you know what, maybe I should just ask her if she wants me to pray for her marriage. You know, like maybe, you know, they're in a really dark spot. But I didn't actually, because can you imagine 22 years old, a little punk like me? Oi, like, do you want me to pray for your marriage? Obviously, it's on the rocks, you know, like you're struggling. My piercings and I had long hair at the time. Like, you know, like, she would have been like, what a jerk. But anyway, I was like, sure, I will pray for your husband. I don't understand it, but I will do it because you've asked nicely and I'm a gentleman. So anyway, so I'm like, I will pray for your husband. And so I go to him like, hey, what seems to be the issue, sir? And uh, he's like, look, my knees are really bad. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, that's fine. And he's like, so what happened was I used to have like cartilage in my knees and I played a lot of sport and a lot of contact sport and slowly but surely it's worn away and there's no cartilage in my knees anymore. So basically what happens is like, you know, like the knee bones, instead of like there being a nice little bit of cushioning there, it's just like this and they just grind on each other and like smash on each other and stuff. It's not very pleasant for people who don't have any cartilage. Uh, And so I was like, you know what, sure, I can pray for that. But in my head I'm thinking, does God do that? Because like I know that like he'll heal broken bones and heal tendons and stuff and he'll take things out of your body that aren't meant to be in your body. But does he put things back that aren't there anymore? You know, I'm like, I haven't uncovered this one. I haven't dealt with this. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible, but I'm like, all right, I don't know if it's going to happen, but God can deal with that. God can just say no by not answering the prayer, you know? So I'm like, sure, that'll be fine. Now, can I get Peter? Oh, can you come up for uh, just to be a volunteer for me, please? That'd be great. Thanks, Peter. Just check. Can we give Peter a round of applause as he comes up on stage? Thanks, Peter. So, Peter, you're going to be this man. Because basically, I knew that I had to pray for this guy, right? And I didn't know heaps about how to pray for people when they're sick um, or they need healing. But I did know from what I'd seen and what Jesus did 
that you touch the afflicted area. Sorry, Peter, face the crowd. See his knees. That's the afflicted area. And so I'm like this. I'm like, all right, mate, I'm going to pray for you. And he's standing there and I'm like, let me begin. And so I touch his legs. He was wearing pants at the time, so it was a little less hairy, but that's okay. And I was like, all right, dear God, I just pray right now that you would bring healing to his knees. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I looked up and I was like, hey, mate, how are your knees? He's like, you say no. No. No what? It's not better. Ah, oh, bummer. <laughs> Let's pray a second time because Jesus prayed a second time. You know, like that's what I was thinking. Jesus prayed twice. I will also pray twice. So I'm like, all right, let's do this. And I knew that maybe my prayer before hadn't been filled with enough Christian words, you know, like forgiven, reconciled, redeemed, the blood of Jesus. You know, like I was like, I need to add these words. So I'm like, all right, let's do this. And I talked a little bit louder, like I was yelling at the knee. I was like, all right, in Jesus' name, I pray that this knee would be redeemed. In Jesus' name, Make this knee reconciled back to you, Father Jesus. John 10.10 10 says we will have fullness of life, and this knee will experience the fullness of life. In Jesus' name, amen. How's it feel now? You also say no again. No, it's not better. Ah, <laughs> oh, what the heck's going on? And at this point, I was like, obviously, Jesus doesn't do this. But anyway, I'll pray a third time, because if Jesus prayed twice, I'm not as good as Jesus, I will pray three times. So anyway, this time I'm really picked up the volume and the words and like the speed. I feel like speed plays an important part in this too. Well, I did at the time. I know now it doesn't, but this is me praying for this random guy I've never met before. I'm like, all right, one more time. Let's do this. Jesus, in the name of your holy Father, we just pray right now that you would just redeem this man with your power and your authority and all power and authority on heaven and earth. You would give to us, Jesus, and we just know that you paid for this on the cross and we just want to, and I'm like, all right, in Jesus' name, amen. What happened? Anything? This time you say, Yes, it's healed. Oh, how do you know? <laughs> do some squats. Oh, yeah, look at that fall. Look at that fall. Thanks, Peter. I'll continue from here because I don't want you to hurt yourself. Okay, thanks, mate. You're, you're a champ. But yeah, this guy genuinely, uh, he was like, yeah, I think that feels good. And you know, the test, you always need to test it. Like if there was things that you couldn't do before that, that, and they would hurt. So he's like squatting. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. That actually feels that good and you know I know but he was like walking around like weird like this you know he's like yeah that feels pretty good he's like man I'm actually starting to feel like pretty good and then he's just like whoosh, like he's like a high kick over there and whoosh, high kick over there and he's like yeah I'm feeling really really good like so good right that when he like after a little bit of praying the preacher was like has anyone here been healed and he's up on the because we're on the second balcony like he's like I've been healed I've been healed like he's doing these ones you know like trying to like I've been healed and they're like you, sir. And he's like, yes, me. And we're like, they're like, what happened? He's like, I didn't have college in my knees and now I do. And everyone's like, I don't know if God does that, but that's amazing. And they're like, who prayed for you? He must be so anointed. And he's like, this kid. And I'm like, it's me. And they're like, whoa, you're so anointed. And then everyone was coming to me and I was laying here. Nah, I'm just kidding. Like, can you imagine? That would be so much my dream. Oh, I wish. Just thousands. Just Anyway, another time, another time. Maybe today. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> Everyone's nervous now. They're like, ooh. Um, but yeah, so that happened. I was like, this was amazing. And like, I was pumped. Like, even now, I kind of look back and go, like, can you believe that? Imagine you were there and you just saw someone who didn't have cartilage in his knees have cartilage in his knees. And you prayed that prayer. Imagine how hyped you'd be. That's how hyped I was. I'm like walking around like, I am, this is like, God is good. God is powerful. Like, I get on the phone to my friends at home and I'm like, boys, I got news. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, I was single at the time, so they probably thought it was a girl, but I was like, nah, not a girl. Better. God. And they're like, okay, tell me what happened. I was like, dude, you're never going to believe it. Like, he didn't have cartilage, and now he's got cartilage. And like, man, it was absolutely insane. And you know, like, I used to think like, some things are too impossible, but with God, man, all things are possible. You know, like, I'm preaching to him down the phone. I'm like, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. Okay, well, that's cool. But like, we need to go out, we need to like heal people. We need to go and do this stuff. I'm hyped. Like, I'm, I'm walking around all hyped up and they're like, cool, man. Like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, like, they just didn't get it, man. It was so disappointing. But anyway, I was hyped up and I was like, I am going to go back to church and on Sunday, I'm going to see anyone that even looks like they're just limping. And I'm going to be like, 
in the name of Jesus, you will be. You know, like I'm like, I'm hyped. I'm ready to pray for everyone and anyone. And you know what happened? I got back and Hawthorne was playing the footy that night. And they won, which was awesome. And then I actually had a, a, busy, a busy week the week after because I had like a, a 2,500 word uni assignment that I had to submit by next Sunday. I hadn't started it yet. And um, so I didn't really leave the house for a week. What was that? Oh, I just thought someone said something to me. Oh, that's cool. Anyway, so I was doing all that, and uh, I just got a little bit distracted, and I forgot about it, and it was about 12 months, 12 months before I prayed for someone else to have healing in their life again. And I looked back, and I was like, oh, what was I doing? That was such a waste of time. That's 12 months, and who knows how many people with no cartilage in their knees that I didn't pray for, you know? I was like, I'm missing out on this opportunity, and all these people are now walking around with like, oh, my knees hurt. If only someone had prayed for them. And like, I didn't, you know? Like, that was my fault. And so anyway, I was like, why has this happened? I wish I'd continued to be as passionate about that as I had been that night. Like, why hadn't I just continued to seek that out? And maybe you guys are here and some of you have had a similar experience. Maybe for you it was in worship. You know, you're like, you just one Sunday you were here and you're like, holy moly, like, I'm praising Jesus and I can feel his presence in a profound way. Like, this is amazing. I like this. I would like to do this more. Or maybe for some of you it was like you are reading the Bible and there was that first time you read it and you're like, whoa. That makes sense. Like, that spoke to me. Like, in my circumstances right now, I should read this more. Or maybe for some of you, it has been one of those things. You prayed for someone and you saw God do something really cool in their life. Like, you know, they were in tears about, like, something that God had said to them. Or you saw that God healed them in some really cool way. And then you're like, man, I need to do that more. Maybe some of you in that room, in the room are like this. And, you know, you're like, I need to do this more. But you kind of haven't. Maybe for some of you, you're in the room and you're like, you know what, I want that experience. I don't feel like I've had it yet. I don't feel like I've had that experience in worship or the, or the word or, you know, in praying for people. I haven't had that experience. It makes me go, damn, God is good. Like, I want to have more of that in my life. You know, like, you haven't had that experience yet. But maybe there's some of you here and you're actually a little bit skeptical. Like, you're like, yeah, it was a funny story, man, but did it really happen? That's cool. Like, you're welcome here. You're allowed to be here if you're skeptical. But I want to encourage you to have an open mind and an open heart because I believe today that God is going to speak to us about his supernatural power and how he wants us to walk in it more. Because I don't think God wants us to just have these supernatural experiences when we're at church, when we're on youth camp, when we're at a Christian conference. Like, I think God wants us to have these supernatural experiences every single day. He wants it to be a day-to-day reality for us. And today, we're going to jump into... uh, Luke chapter 8 verses 40 to 48 to see a couple of principles that I found there that I think God wants us to understand so that we can walk in his supernatural power and have more supernatural experiences and encounters in our life. So if you've got your Bibles or your phones with your Bibles, please turn to Luke 8 verses 40 to 48. That would be amazing. Cool. Let's read it together. All in one voice. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. An interesting story, hey? Interesting story. A few little things happening. In the midst of it. But I don't know if you picked it up straight away. This is just a really quick, simple point for you guys to get. Jesus is doing this not on a special day. He's not doing it on church day. He's not doing it at a conference. He's not doing it at some crusade. He's not doing it at a camp. He's just going about his day-to-day life. He's been somewhere and he's come back and now he's just wandering somewhere. Jesus is just going about doing life and in that time he heals someone. And this is where we see that principle that The supernatural acts, the supernatural encounters are meant for our everyday. They're not just meant for those special moments, but they're meant for everyday. Because we see that Jesus had these moments in his life every day. That was how Jesus lived his life. 
And so for us, if we want to see these supernatural encounters happen more in our day-to-day lives, there's a couple of things we can learn. And the first thing we can learn is if we want to see supernatural encounters, we need to see supernatural opportunities. See, in this story, there's a couple of things that we probably miss, but we need to understand. Firstly, we see this guy named Jairus. Now, Jairus is a synagogue leader. So Jairus is really important. And we know that because we get his name in the story and his job title. So Jairus, the synagogue leader, is coming to Jesus to ask him, not just for anything, but to heal his dying daughter. So what we see here is we see that we have an important person who is well known with an urgent issue. His daughter is dying that day. Like, if Jesus doesn't get to her soon, she will be dead. So an important person who's well known with an urgent issue. Now, I can imagine if I was Jairus and this was my daughter, not that I have a daughter, but if I do, I'm just imagining, I would be pretty keen for Jairus to get there, I mean, Jesus to get there as quick as possible. If I was Jairus, I'd be like, all right, Jesus, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like, let's run, put it in Strava, just let's get a clock, like, see how fast we can do this. You know, I bet I can win. You know, like, I'd just be trying to get in there as fast as possible. But imagine how you would feel when you're Jairus and you turn around and Jesus has stopped. And Jesus has stopped. And not just for any reason, but because Jesus is just asking the dumbest question Jesus has ever asked. Jesus is in a crowd. We see this phrase that says, Jesus was in a crowd that almost crushed him. If it almost crushed him, you could imagine that there's a lot of people touching Jesus. And Jesus stops and asks this question, who touched me? Jesus, come on, like heaps of people touch you. It's genuinely the dumbest question Jesus has ever asked. And we've got to record it here. Like, you know, who touched me? Who touched me? And that's why Peter goes like, Jesus, like, heaps of people touched you. Like, you literally almost got crushed just before. Lots of people have touched you. But what we miss is that Jesus has recognized that power has gone out of him. And all of a sudden, he goes, you know what? This is, the, this is an opportunity for a supernatural encounter. He recognizes the opportunity. And that is why Jesus stops. And do you know what we find out? We find out that Jesus doesn't just stop for anyone. Jesus stops for a woman. Now, that doesn't sound like much. But notice how Jairus had a name. And this woman doesn't. She's just called a woman. Yeah, well, imagine how you would feel if I just called you the boy. Or imagine if I just called you the girl. I was like, I don't even want to know your name. You're just the kid. You know, like imagine that. That is her. But not only is that her name, just the woman, but her job title is the woman with bleeding. Imagine that's what you're known for. Imagine that's your reputation. Jairus, the synagogue leader is important and well-known with an urgent issue. Here's an unknown woman who isn't important is defined by this gross thing that she has in their time, like it was considered gross and unclean and dirty. And she's been living with it for 12 years and seems to be doing all right. Like she's able to get, get around, she's walking, she's fine. She's got a non-urgent issue. This is an unknown, unimportant woman with a non-urgent issue and Jesus stops for her because he recognizes the opportunity. Jesus stops for her because he recognizes the opportunity. And I don't know about you, but I wonder how many opportunities I've missed. Wonder how many opportunities I've missed. Like, so you guys can know me a little bit better as your pastor. Uh, one thing that you should know about me is I love getting things done. So like, I have my to-do list and I love ticking things off. I just love getting things done. But I'm also a massive introvert. So I love getting things done by myself. You know, like my ideal day, and this is going to sound real weird, but like my ideal day is waking up knowing I don't have to talk to anyone. You know, like, like, especially on a Monday, like after a big day at Sunday, like, I love this. I love being with you guys. But there's just this, this peaceful joy when I wake up on Monday morning and go, I don't have to see anyone today. Like, that's me. I just love it. There's something about it. It's just me with my thoughts, just relaxing, doing my thing. So can you imagine how it feels for me to be working in an office with six other women? So there's Tracy, there's Danny, there's Bethany, there's Donna, there's Cherith, and there's Jess and me all in the one office. Now, if you guys know any of them, like Joey lives with Jess because it's his sister. She talks a lot, you know, and Tracy talks a lot. Like some of these people talk a lot. And so I'm involved in a lot of conversations. By the time I go home on a Tuesday afternoon, the last thing I want to do is have another conversation. I'm the guy who goes into Woolworths and I put my headphones in and I'm like, you know what? I'm just like, please don't let anyone know me. Please don't let anyone talk to me. You know, like, that's kind of like what I'm doing. I'm like, just let me get my Tim Tams and get out of here. You know, like, that's, that's my vibe when I'm in there. <laughs> it's like, please, please, please. And not that I, like, if someone's there, I won't be like, hey, it's great to see you, because it genuinely is. But it's just this mindset where it's like, I'm tired. 
I'm busy, I've got things to do, I need to buy myself some Tim Tams, you know, like, that's just what I need to do, like, I'm trying to get important things done for the most important person in my life, me, you know, like, not my wife, me, I'm the most important person in my life, I spend the most time with me, I'm hungry and I feel it, you know, like, you know, that's, that's just it. And so, I get there and then I wonder, though, I wonder how many times I've missed an opportunity, how many times I've missed an opportunity, just those little things where you look down the aisle and you can see that lady and you're like, ah, oh, she's struggling to get that, but... She will. And, you know, <laughs> you just walk off, you know, like those little opportunities where you could just walk up and all it would take is me going, hey, do you want me to get that? And, you know, you never know what happens after that. Like it's just seeing that opportunity. And I just wonder how many opportunities I miss because Jesus is willing to stop for an unknown, unimportant, non-urgent issue when he's in the middle of doing something urgent for someone important. And I go, you know what, if that's how Jesus operates, then I can't let my personality or my personal preferences get in the way of me missing opportunities. And you guys shouldn't either. You shouldn't be like that. You can't be like, oh, I'm an introvert, so I don't talk to new people. Or I'm an introvert, so I don't go and do this. Or be like, I'm an extrovert, so I don't want to talk to people who can't have a good conversation with me. Like, don't let those things get in the way. Like, just because you're like, oh, you know, I'm a bit busy or I want to do this. Like, you can't let those things get in the way. We can't be people who go, oh, I missed it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's just not how I operate. Like, that's not okay. That's not an excuse. Jesus was doing something important and urgent, and he stopped for someone unknown, unimportant, with a non-urgent issue. That's how Jesus operates, and that's how we should too. Now, the last thing we need to understand, and this is really important for us to get, is there's one more principle. If we want to see supernatural encounters, we need to see supernatural opportunities, but there's one more thing we have to get if we really want to get this, and it's how Jesus interacts with a girl who's been bleeding for 12 years. Now, This woman, as we said, has been bleeding for 12 years. And what this means, right, is in our day, there's kind of things that you guys might have. Like, you know, like if we have eczema right these days, like you can just like keep going about doing your stuff. You put some treatment on it, you go around because it's non-contagious. It's not an issue. Like people just carry on with that, you know, that's fine. But back then, if you had something like eczema or you're struggling with like this bleeding thing, you are considered ceremonially unclean. That's right, you're considered unclean. Now, to put it in more terms that you'll understand, you're considered filthy, you're considered dirty, you're considered gross. And not only do people say that about you, but you're physically not allowed to live in the same community as clean people. So there was a city, right, that everyone would live in, and if you were unclean, there was a place built just for you, just outside the city, where you could go and live with all the other unclean people. So this woman because of her issue, has been removed from her friends, has been removed from her family, has no longer got a job, is not allowed to be in the city. She has to live outside of it for 12 years because she's considered unclean. Imagine that, like you having to live like that. So she's going through that. But more than that, this woman has to do something incredibly, incredibly degrading. Imagine this. So if she wants to go in the city to go to a doctor or she wants to go and buy some food, she has to do this. If she's walking through a crowd, she has to yell this, unclean, unclean, unclean. So just as she's walking through, unclean, unclean, don't touch me, like unclean, you can't touch me or I'll mess you all up. Unclean, 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 oh, unclean, like, you know, like, don't touch me, unclean, unclean. Imagine having to declare that over yourself. And just to make it really clear for you guys, so you guys really understand what she had to went through. Imagine, you know, right now, imagine if I got you up and I said, you know that thing that you think makes you unworthy of God's love? You know that thing that you think makes you broken? You know that thing that you're totally ashamed of? Imagine having to stand up here and do what I just did, walk amongst your peers and declare it over yourself. No, imagine it, like seriously. Think of that thing right now in your head. Don't laugh about it, because you wouldn't be laughing. Unloved, unloved, abandoned, addicted. Imagine having to do that. That's what this woman had to do every single time she walked into the city for 12 years in front of the same people time and time again. Anytime she wanted to go to the doctor, before she even got there, she told thousands of people that she was unclean. How degrading. That's how unwanted, unknown, and unvalued this woman was. Not even just to everyone else, but how she would have felt about herself. Imagine having to say that over and over and over again over yourself 
in front of everyone. Imagine how you presumed everyone thought of you. Can you imagine? She would have thought, I'm so unworthy, I'm so unwanted, I'm so unloved. And we see that she believes that because when you see the difference between how she goes to, like, to Jesus, Jairus walks up to Jesus and just says, hey, Jesus, can you help me out? Because he knows he's important. He knows people care about him. He knows people value him. She sneaks up and just touches the back of his cloak because she goes, I don't want to bother him. I'm not really worth his time. Maybe this will help. And if not, I don't want to have wasted his time. That's her experience. That's how she sees herself. So much so that she thinks Jesus wouldn't have any time for her because she's so unwanted, so unknown, so unloved, so uncared for. And yet we see this incredible thing. She does this and we see Jesus stops, asks that dumb question, who touched me? And she comes forward thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the end. They've realized that I'm unclean and that I've made everyone dirty because I went through the crowd, mucked everyone up, and then I touched Jesus and made him unclean too. So she comes, it says trembling, which literally means to be afraid of the consequence. She's terrified about what's about to unfold. She thinks everyone's going to want her dead. She's going to think everyone's going to kill me, even Jesus. They're going to be like, all right, you're dirty, kill her. You know, like that's what she thinks is about to um, unfold. But what do we see Jesus do? Jesus turns to her and he says this. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, I don't want you to miss the importance of this. Daughter is a pretty important word. You know, like if you're a son or you're a daughter, there's a statement there about how you are, you are someone's like blood of their blood. You are valued by someone. You are like a part of someone's family. You belong, you're cared for, you're known, you're loved. And so when Jesus says to this woman, daughter, he's not saying we're family. He's saying, you are known. You are important. You are loved. You are cared for by me. You are cared for by me. Jesus says that to her. And do you know what the coolest thing is? This is the only time Jesus ever calls anyone daughter. The only time. And he chooses her. The unknown, unwanted, unloved, uncared for woman. That's who Jesus chooses. And this is what we have to understand. If we want to see supernatural opportunities, we have to see people how God sees people. See, Jesus stopped because he knew the incredible value this woman had. He, she was his daughter. She would do, he would do anything for her. And imagine how the crowd felt when they thought, holy moly, is this Jesus' daughter? Like, I imagine they did the quick, like, hang on, how old is she and how old is he? You know, because they were like, imagine if we've treated Jesus' daughter this terribly for the last 12 years. Like, imagine, imagine if we've treated Jesus' daughter this terribly for 12 years. Imagine how mad Jesus is going to be. Because Jesus cared about her and she was important to Jesus. But when, when people get this, when you start seeing people how Jesus sees people, you will want to do the exact same things Jesus did for them. You want to show them love. You want to show them value. You want to show them importance. See, I remember when I was about five years old, I was at the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, watching Hawthorne play in the footy. Now, so you guys understand, the Gabba and Sum Court can hold about 40,000 people. The MCG can hold 100,000 people. So I'm at a game with 80,000 people. I'm five years old. I'm with my dad. Now, my dad, he's like sort of here. He just says, Ben, just stay right there. I just need to have a look around this corner here to just check where we need to go to get out because it's like five levels and like multiple different doors. Around. Like it's crazy. And he's like, I'm just going to go there and have a look. Now, dad was probably gone for five seconds, but you know when you're five, it feels like five minutes and you get bored. And so I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on. I was like, oh, dad's not there. He said he'd be back already. And then I just wandered off in a crowd of 80,000 people. I walked out the front gate. And I was like, I have no idea. I was terrified. I was so scared. I was like, I have no idea where, any, where, where, where my dad is. And I am so lost. And there's all these big, like, drunk, old, like, blokes. Like, oh, I'm taking a specky. Like, doing all this sort of, like, dumb stuff. And I'm terrified. I'm like, what's going on? And this woman, a mum, she comes up to me. And I, said, I remember, because she's got, like, her kids. And she comes up and she's like, hey, you all right? I said, I don't know where my dad is. And she's like, that's okay. Can you see him around here? And I said, no, I can't. And she's like, that's all right. Come with me. And she took me to the police, and the police put me in the lost property, and then my dad, <laughs> and then my dad came and found me. But do you know what the difference was between her and those other like drunk blokes going around? She had kids. She knew how important I was to someone. And what you guys need to get is every person, look around to the people beside you, look around, seriously, look to the people beside you, look to the people behind you, look to the people on the other side of the room. You see those people? 
they are just as valuable, just as important, and just as loved by God as you are. If Jesus died on the cross for you, he died on the cross for them. If Jesus wants to move in your life, he wants to move in theirs. See, when we get it, when we finally see people how Jesus sees people, we'll see opportunities and we'll see encounters because we'll finally get on board with what it is that God wants us to do. And that is what we need to understand. Because once we get this, you're going to see these opportunities at your school. You're going to seize these opportunities at your, in your family. You know, your sibling that is so annoying is all of a sudden you're going to be like, you know what, as much as they're a pain in my backside, they're valued, they're important, they're loved by God. You know, like you're going to see these opportunities to pray for them, to care for them, to support them, to help them. You're going to see it uh, on your, like, you know, your journey to school uh, each morning. You might see the same people on the bus or on the train or wherever you get there. Like, you know what, they're valuable, they're important. I should strike up a conversation with her because she always sits by herself. Or I should strike up a conversation with him because I know that he doesn't really have any friends at recess or at lunchtime. And you know what? He's valuable. He's important. And I'm going to be honest. I know that it can seem scary and I'm not asking you to do anything crazy. All I'm asking is like for you guys to think about doing a couple of these things. Number one, can you just in the morning just ask God, God, who is the one person? Who's the one person that I'm going to have an opportunity to show value or love or pray for, like, who is the one person? I'm not asking you to go out and change the world in a week. Just ask God if there's one person who each day you can make a difference in their lives. Because you don't know how supernatural what you might do might be. Like, I've heard crazy stories about what people have done because they just stepped out in faith. And, you know, like, there was that person who was like, you know, they, they woke up that morning, they're like, am I valued? Am I loved? Am I cared for? Do people really notice me? Like, would anyone notice if I wasn't here? You know, they're having those thoughts. And someone goes up to him and says, hey man, I just want to say how great it is having you in class and I really love, like, you know, your sense of humor. You're a great guy. I'm really glad you're my friend. You know, they just think they're being nice and yet it speaks exactly to like this anxiety and fear that they had and it stops something terrible from happening. You don't know how supernatural just that can be. It could be something as simple as is just that, just saying encouraging words for, to other people, but it could be something as simple as inviting people into community, inviting people into friendships. You know, what I love about this story and what you might have missed is often we focus on the physical healing. This woman who hadn't been healed for 12 years got healed, but you know what else happened? She was relationally healed too. Because all of a sudden, after these 12 years, she was allowed to now have friends again. She was allowed to go back to her family. She was allowed to have a job. She was allowed to hang out. She was allowed to go to local temp in bowling alley. She was allowed to do all these things all over again. She got restored. She got healed relationally. And sometimes relationship restoration is just as supernatural as physical healing. And in fact, God values it just as much because we see in this story that both of those things happen at the same time. So inviting someone into a friendship group, even just here, you might see someone here, you go, I don't know if they've really connected in. I don't know if they really have anyone. In fact, I see them out there just after the service, they're standing off by themselves and you go, you know what? I need to go and be friends with them. I need to go invite them in. That can be supernatural. You don't know how supernatural it can be. And I just think when we finally get this, when we go, you know what, this is what we need to do. We have decided that we're going to be supernatural people. And we decided that we're going to show people, you know, God's value of them. And, you know, we're going to show people just how much God loves them. We're going to take every opportunity that we can. And we're going to see supernatural encounters. We will see incredible things happen. You'll see people's lives changed. And all of a sudden, you'll have your own stories about how God's supernatural power was poured out through you. You'll, you'll just be able to go, you know what, like, imagine just coming back next week and like, you know, you guys are like, hey, here is this cool thing that happened this week. I got to talk to this guy or, you know, like I prayed for my friend at school. You know, like you just saw cool things happen because you saw the value in people and you saw the opportunities and then you just took them. You know, you made them happen. Imagine having those stories and imagine not having like, you know, like me, like that story happened five years ago. That's probably all right, but... I was saying last Sunday night, I was like, I don't want to get to the point where I'm doing a similar message in five years' time, and this is the only story that I've got. I want more stories. I want to see more of God's supernatural power in my life. I want to see God change people through my prayers. I want to see God use me to make a difference in the lives of other people, even something that I think was so small, but for them was so supernatural. I want to have those stories. I want to see those things happen. I really do. And I want to see those things happen for you too. Because once you have them, once you see them happen, everything changes. Everything changes. And we will see Brisbane, we'll see your schools, we'll see people's lives change because they finally experienced 
Jesus. They finally got God in their lives in a way that they're like, wow, I never thought this was possible. And so my encouragement for you is to be those people. Go, oh God, I want these supernatural opportunities. I want to make them happen. And we're just going to invite the band up now because we're going to make this opportunity happen. Because... While I said that we want to see these things happen outside of Sunday and outside of camps and outside of, church, like, you know, outside of conferences and all those sort of things, the great thing is that they do still happen here. And God wants to use these times to make his power and his presence known. And so what I want us to do is I actually want us to take this opportunity that we have to see if we can do something small that might just be supernatural. And so what I'm going to do is in a moment we're going to stand and I'm going to pray for you guys. But what I'm going to be praying is I'm going to be praying that God would give you people in this room to go and pray for. That God would give you a prompting to go, you know what, I need to go and pray for that guy over there. I don't know why, but I feel like God wants me to go and pray for him. And then I want you to go and pray for them. Now, we did it this morning and we had, um, we had this uh, girl. We had a couple of leaders praying for other people. We had this girl. She was just in the second row, just right there. And she just like felt like she needed to pray for the girl just right in the front here. And it was so cool, right? She just like, she was nervous. I could see it. I'm on stage, I'm watching. I'm like, I think she wants to pray for this girl. I'm like, do it. So I said, go, like, if you want to pray, go and pray for him. She did it. And it was so beautiful, right? I watched her pray for this girl and then they hug and I'm like, oh, bless, you know, like my heart. And then this girl, right? This girl goes back there, but this girl is beaming. She's just like this. She's like, that was amazing. And so at the end of the service, I was like, hey, like, what did you think? Like, did you like being prayed for? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, do you wish like she would pray for you again? She's like, yeah. And I was like, like, do you want people to never pray? She's like, no, I like it. And I'm like, did you feel valued? And she's like, yes. I was like, that's great. And I said to her friend, I was like, you know, like, that was awesome. You know, can you see the difference just your prayer made? You were nervous as, and she's like, yeah, I was terrified. So yeah, but see the difference that your one prayer made. This person that was all of a sudden like, she's going to walk out of here going, my friend felt like she wanted to pray for me. Like, you know that? Like the worst thing that can happen as we do this is you're going to pray for someone. I know, terrible, horrific, isn't it? The worst thing that can happen is you're going to pray for someone. The best thing that can happen is God's going to use you to do a supernatural act in someone's life. I mean, talk about a win-win. You, the worst that can happen is you pray for someone. The best that can happen is God's supernatural power is poured out into someone else's life. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the opportunities. And you're going to be scared. You're going to be nervous. That girl wasn't. They were friends. They know each other and she was still nervous. Last week, we heard about Grace's story about how she was at Hillsong Conference and she was standing next to her friend. And she felt like God said, pray for her. And she's like, I'm too scared to do it. It's like, it's your friend. And she said after, she's like, I feel like an idiot because it was like, it's my friend. As if she's going to be like, no, don't pray for me. So that's what we're going to do because I genuinely believe this morning God wants to pour out His supernatural power and presence through you into the lives of others. But we're going to spend a moment. So if you can just stand to your feet, just where you are, just stand to your feet right now. And we're going to pray and we're going to ask God, God, who is it that you want me to pray for? And I'm going to pray that you would have the courage to go and pray for Him. Now, just to be, just to be clear, this is, a, this is a, a serious moment, you know? Like this isn't a time where we want to distract other people because if God's moving, God might, might want to be doing something in the lives of people around you. So when you're talking to the guy next to you, you're not just stopping yourself from experience God's, experiencing God's presence, you're stopping him or her too, okay? So let's just wait. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to encourage you to go and pray for these people. All right. Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you now, Lord, and I just pray right now that you would speak to us. Lord, we know that you want to use us to pour out your supernatural power and presence into the lives of others. And Lord, I pray right now that you would give these people words. I pray that you would give these people names. I pray that you would give these people just people that they need to go and pray for right now. And Lord, I pray that you would give them courage and confidence to go and do it because they know that the worst that's going to happen is that they're going to pray for someone. And the best thing that could happen is that you might use them to pour out your power into someone's life. And Lord, I pray right now that you would help us to do this. In your mighty and powerful name, amen.